First of all, I'm going to take you through some of the bends individually. Driving on the wrong line through any one of them will lower your lap speed, so let's look at them very carefully. We turn into paddock fairly late, and as the car reaches the steepest part of the drop, we should be on the inside. Then we let the car slide across to the left, getting there just by the SO sign. This is a tricky bend, the camber isn't exactly helpful, and it's slightly blind. Climbing up Pilgrim's Rise, we enter Druids in a wide sweep, keeping the car close to the inside until quite late in the turn, when the road begins to straighten out again. Then we pay out to the left, either with the power or steering. Bottom bend is approached from the right. We move over to the left to a late apex and return to the right of the road just as the checkered curb ends. We turn in early for South Bank Bend and hold the car in a power slide, allowing it to move over to the right using the full width of the road as the bend tightens and we approach the bridge. We start this fast uphill right hand are fairly wide, beginning our turn quite early and pushing the apex to the very end of the corner. Then we bring the car over to the left, just beyond the broken curb at the side of the track. Breaking after Portobello Strait, we enter Westfield Bend from the left, pulling over to clip the right-hand apex and using all the road as we sweep back to the outside, arriving at the edge of the circuit near a big tree. Dingledale Corners a sharp, blind right-hander. We begin our turn just before the 100-yard sign, smoothing the corner by clipping the apex and then swinging over to the left again. We enter Sterling's Bend from the right, and not too quickly. Then we steer hard over to the left, being careful not to let the car out again too early, because this bend tightens up a lot. It's certainly got a sting in its tail. At Clearways, we rejoin the old circuit and begin this long bend from well over to the left. It's a difficult camber that pulls the car to the outside, so we must keep over to the right for as long as possible before lining up for the top straight again. Well, now let's have a go and drive around the circuit at something near competition speed and see how those corners look during a race. <laughs>
gather that first started in 1928 as a motorcycle grass track. This is just before I was born, so I don't know much about it, except that uh, I understand it was owned by a farmer who used to open a gate so he and his friends could have a race around the fields. Well, from there, it started to grow up. And then it became one of the leading grass track uh, places it, in this country, I think, of motorcycles. And it was then surfaced in 1949. And the first race, I believe, was run in April 1950. This was certainly the first race that I was at, and I believe it was about the first race held on the surfaced grass track. It was then a kidney shape and was one of the most interesting circuits because the spectators could really see the whole lot. I don't think there was anywhere in this sort of auditorium that you could sit without seeing or following a driver all the way around, which of course was very good from the spectator's point of view. And from the driver's angle, it was one of the few circuits that we had at that time and was quite a tricky little course. You could lap it somewhere, I think, just over 60 miles an hour, but it was quite exciting because you were continually cornering. There was no straight, and uh, it was the sort of thing I think that all the people were crying out for at that time. But of course now, 1964, the circuit has grown up. It is now the, the place where we hold the British Grand Prix sometimes, and in fact, in 1964, it is of course the European Grand Prix, and therefore it's really come of age. A tremendous amount of time and work and money has been, ex has been expended on the circuit, not only making better facilities for the spectators, but also better facilities for the drivers, washrooms, scrutineering bays, and all, all sorts of facilities for the cars. They've got the proper paddock now, and many, th many, many things, too, too many in fact to mention. But uh, from a driver's angle, I think it's a pleasure to go there because there's still the old crowd, or still the old people that were there in the, f in the original days. The, a lot of the flag marshals are still the same. The people in the pits and paddock and all that, they're sort of the same familiar faces, and I think the drivers enjoy going there. There's also much better facilities now for food, and there's a chance the drivers can, can get a snack whilst they, they're not racing and the mechanics as well. Now, that is the sort of history of Brands Hatch, Going, on, going from there to it as a circuit, it is, I would say, one of the most interesting circuits in the country. It has got quite a lot of tricky corners. I wouldn't call them difficult corners particularly, except maybe paddock. Now, paddock corner, you come over a slight brow, and then you're faced with this quite difficult corner. It's a corner that I think one takes at about 80 miles an hour nowadays, and I'm a little bit worried about saying a speed because in the short time that I've been out of racing, speeds have rocketed upwards, and by the time a person may play this record, may, may already be over 100 miles an hour on something that I was doing at 60. So um, I'm a little bit worried about that, but I would say that paddock can be taken around 80 miles an hour, and if you're not right on the approach, you have a problem, because the camber, although it isn't exactly an adverse camber, doesn't do much to help you. So one wants to be a little bit cautious about this. Anyway, you go round paddock, and then you go down the hill, and you go, come up the other side until you come to Druids. Now, Druids is an interesting corner. Well, as interesting, I should say, as any hairpin corner can be. It is one of the fastest hairpins, I think, in motor racing. It's the sort of corner that uh, people get round at, oh, something around 40 miles an hour. And it can be taken either on a wide line or a closer line without the driver sacrificing too much. I think it's even more important than that because this corner uh, affects very much the corner that follows it. And that is a corner called bottom bend. And depending on the speed that you get round the hairpin, it, it really does affect how fast you can get into or round bottom bend. In fact, if you take the hairpin really well, you have much more trouble with bottom bend than if you take it badly. So those two have to be coupled together, although they are quite a distance apart. Anyway, when you go around the bottom bend, you then sweep into what is known as the bottom straight. I don't know why it's called the bottom straight, because it isn't straight, but still. On entering this bottom straight, you clip right across the right-hand side and more or less brush alongside the grass, and you are once again flat out. When I say flat out, I don't mean that you're at your maximum speed, but you're hard on the accelerator. And then you go along, and you come into 
a corner called South Bank. You come, you come along to South Bank. Now, South Bank, you've just passed the pits on your right where the drivers look for signals, and then they go into this corner called South Bank. Now, South Bank is a long turning corner. It can only be taken at about, well, I suppose, 55 or 60 miles an hour. And when you go round this corner, the problem with it is, is that it's got a sting in the tail because the end of the corner is the slowest part, and therefore one can quite easily find oneself arriving at the end of the corner and with no trouble at all, and then realise that you've got to turn the steering considerably further than you want to, and so you're left with quite a problem. So one wants to watch this corner south bank because you can arrive at the end of it, which is the entry to the straight going faster than you want to, and waste quite a lot of distance down the straight and trying to sort out the problem that you've got on the corner entering the straight. Then going down the straight, you sweep down a sort of dip. This dip, of course, increases the speed even of modern Grand Prix cars and of the slower cars and takes them up to their maximum that they will reach on the circuit. And when you get to the bottom of it, you pull quite a bit of G because it's quite a steep sort of drug like an aeroplane pulling out of a out of a dive and you certainly feel it and the cars are inclined to bottom on their suspension. This is known as Pilgrim's Drop. This is the fastest part on the circuit, definitely. Hawthorne's Bend is a is a very nice, gentle, right-handed, right-angled corner. It's a very fast sort of right-handed corner. I'd, I imagine that one would get round it from or oh, around 80 miles an hour, and it is not one where the end tightens in or anything. It's a nice, comfortable corner that I think is quite exhilarating to drive. And then it leads into a short straight, and then we're into Westfield Corner, which is very similar to... Uh, Hawthorne's corner, but it is slightly more acute. It's uh, just the same sort of corner, but it is more acute to the extent that I reckon you, you go around it about 10 miles an hour less than the one before, that is about 70 miles an hour, we'll say. And uh, you go around this, you cut it in close, and then you go out wide on the exit. And then you go down a sort of dip, and you come into Dingle Dell corner. Now, when you well, when I say down the dip, you go down the dip and up the other side, and then you come to Dingle Dell Corner. And Dingle Dell Corner is another one, rather like the two preceding corners, that's Westfield Corner and Hawthorne's Bend, although it is, again, slightly slower. Not much. It's more or less the same as Westfield. Anyway, you go around this corner and swing out to the left-hand side of the road, and then you go down a very short straight again to Sterling's Bend. Now this, I think, is one of the most difficult ones and can only be taken at about 50 miles an hour. And the problem with this one is like the one where we led off the, off the small circuit onto the long Grand Prix circuit because this one tightens up on its exit. And therefore one can be sailing around it thinking everything's just dandy and then suddenly you find it's tighter. Then we go around Stirling's Bend, then we go into Stirling Strait which is a short straight where the faster cars will get their speed up again in time to come into clearways. Clearways is where we join the old circuit, and in fact we only drive round half what was clearways, and we can take it now, I think, at 70 to 80 miles an hour, and it is quite a pleasant corner where we start on the left, pull her over to the right, because if we keep on the left, the camber does drop away a bit, and I think the corner would become very much more difficult than if we had managed to hold the right until we're coming out of it.